Hello everyone. Today I would like to talk about golden paths. Or better yet, how to walk on golden paths. You see, in reality, there are many dimensions of consideration, and an aspect of our consideration of our world is actually our world. So we are considering we're individually standing here, and there's this whole world. Now, when you look at the potentials this being has from the beginning of its birth to its death, there's a, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. There are certain things you can do, and there's various states of consciousness. What that means is that billionaire sitting in his mansion and that kid in poverty sitting in Africa are both uh, being on one kind of... They're, they're in this plane of existence, and they're having certain experiences here. Do you see? And based on different results, based on different actions. Now, what I like about Buddhist culture is that the Buddha saw this and he's like, oh, this is karma. <laughs> so he realized his lack of knowing was from before. And so it, it kind of diverged and in a sense integratively by looking at your world and realizing in a fractal manner, there is less impulses to uh, constantly relate yourself you relate yourself to things but you become an observer observer of relativity you become an observer of relativity in your life and you look at your relationships and it, it might get a bit hectic because sometimes you look at some relationships you have you see that in a sense you have never had them they have been considerations, masks you've worn on your face and you have become certain people to certain people but you've wondered of where the continuation was. Because we're beings in a temporal reality, there is this constant sense of wanting to know where we are and where we're going. We must accept this. Accept this in your life and recognize you are a temporal being, but do not be afraid of death. Death is suggesting a state of consciousness. It's perhaps going to be your last state of a uh, very interesting view of this plane of existence. That moment you're getting off the plane is that moment where <laughs> you will kind of see, you know, it's uh, you're stepping into a new airport. You see, Right now, man is not sensitive to his thought because we are trying to accumulate and survival is suggesting that a part of us doesn't want to let go, but a part, a part of us has to. What that means is we're kind of like walking candles. And what that really implies is that we get this self-awareness, we recognize ourselves in the mirror, but we're like, gosh this awareness is going to change. And so man must realize from the greatest principle of his world, the change in his understanding. For you stand under many things to keep them real. That moment when you are <laughs> helping your friend to cross the wall very quickly, you have to use your hands. You have to stand there as a pillar of holding that being until he crosses the wall. So similarly, you have to do the same. But beings who begin to realize the nature of this reality confront a sense of spiritual aloneness, which is part of, part of a filtration process. Because in a sense, you are looking at reality and then going into a state of consciousness by realizing you have always been there. And as you have been there, you're letting go of frameworks of thought and identity you've had. And it's going to be a huge confrontation because it's an idea for the first time to putting down its weapon of ego. <laughs> but at the same time, ego is not something to be broken. You just need to get that subtlety and awareness that you are not thought. And so you will become and enjoy human communication much more. Because trust me, the, mo the first beginning years of my life, I was trying. <laughs> to communicate. It was ridiculous. And until that moment where I sat down and became still, I realized when you don't want nothing from this world, you really see what you have. And it's not nothing. It's everything. Because it takes you to an intelligence beyond no thing. The beauty of this world 
is how to some degree it captures you to let this manifestation move and you being aware that it is all happening now. When you see that the interpretation is coming from the novelty of the fabrication of how you're interpreting your moment where you are, again right now, novelty is your greatest guide and so novelty suggested the changes were happening and so if we become existentially sensitive you will not, it, it, it's, it's, it's as if, how would I say it, if my whole life I, I, ha, I was holding one of my legs and I was just hopping around with one leg trying to go to IHOP, <laughs> I would see that of course because you need to use both legs. You're designed here to walk in both legs and for the ways that the human being is un constantly making an idea out of himself is not your natural state of expression. That moment after your achievement where you are allowing the world in its stillness to uh, in a sense show the greatness of what you have done, the, the actions that you have done, you will see the serenity in how is, is how you have found your moment to have always gracefully been here. If you recognize and acknowledge yourself as a moment of being, as a moment of experience before a have-to sense of a humanity or a human ideology or a human personality, you are working with existential presence so your alignments are coming from the freshness of your views to your moment. That moment when your idea is aware of its change is when your idea has never been that idea. The minute you're aware of a party, <laughs> it's coming on, it seems like, oh my God, party, let's, you know, your mind is trying to get you into that greater room of experience. And so we look at this reality and whether we're a mystic or whether we are just a person walking on the street having no clue about any clues. <laughs> In the grace of who you are, man has always been true. Begin communicating with your world compassionately. And I will tell this to all the compassionate and kind people. You will begin being, you will act first, you know, first the recommendations. If you were to perhaps see the beauty in Dharma is that you begin to align your intentions and you're like, all right, if I'm going to live, if I see that my thoughts can have an influence, even to if it's 0.0001% of influence on this world, I will put the intention for the greater vision. Wake up in the morning and align yourself with the view that the greatness of your world and it is how you live it and how you are alive here. You see, what I like about practice, and I've, I've kind of noticed this in, in uh, religious culture and also in many other different uh, cu uh, cultures that had spiritual practice, because in a sense, it is an alignment of your thought. What is being confused is the mindfulness of how you are a present in thought and then you are an awareness to objectivity. If you lose the awareness to the presence of thought, you will look at an object and feel like an object because you're not allowing yourself to see much more. What that means is how much of your, uh, of your states of being alive, different ways that you can literally be aware of life, have you experienced rather than read or try to theorize. Because trust me, I've, I've had my own theory books and at the end I realized, gosh, wh where's my experiences? <laughs> and so I realized that what a person does when he seeks knowledge is that he gets an amazing amount of direct experience of reading. But at the same time, you also get a sense of fabrication from extracting out of word and so you become more able in language as well. But at the same time, you must see that it is not about how we are kept here by the hands of polarity to be in a certain spectrum of choice. We are beyond the factors that are meaningless. Our sense of guidance must come from an aspect within us that is enabled to be free. You must be a free being and you must be a free being in thought. That moment you're calling yourself stressed, depressed, guess what? It kind of looks like a slave mentality. Mr. Within doesn't like it. Fix it up immediately. In an instant you can choose to have a new idea. <laughs> And that's perhaps the profoundity of listening because there have been moments in life where 
in the presence of what I have been aware of in that moment, it's as if my moment has become my voice in a manner where I was the silence. You see, when you speak, you're being the noise in your environment. But when you become the silence as a, as a moment of experience, you also are there present and you are just at the silence of the world while the world is talking, you know? When man finds a stillness in his individuality and a sense of orientation in the individual consciousness to just be still and silent, the individuality fades because an idea is trying to survive. And when you take the survivor, when you take everything that is running in this life and you stop it, in an instant, the world begins running. Because how there is a sense of transmutation in regards to existential observance, as you become still, you're more aware of movement. As you move, you become aware of stillness. I remember a friend of mine saying this to me, and I did, I did not really grasp it until I actually sat down in nature and I closed my eyes and I kind of dissolved myself in natural mantra. The choice is not invalid because you are not realizing that you don't know what you're going to do even in a few hours, perhaps. But a part of you is projecting it. And if you are too convinced by your projection, then who you really are, you know, it's that moment when life has thrown a ball at you and you're, you must catch it, you know. Whether it's with your head, whether it's with your chest where your heart is, or whether it's with your ankle in a way that <laughs> only certain footballers on YouTube can do it. <laughs> there is a bliss to how you will fall into a sense of graceful, and it becomes a very silent and still sense of being where you do not become, or uh, your association of life is no longer done. As just as someone. It's like that moment where you're very still and silent. Suddenly someone comes to speak. Their voices align with your thought. For you have found the gentleness and compassion to allow such a dissolution. And it's a, it's a flow. When, when Mr. Within says dissolution, of course, guys, and transcendence, you must realize it is states of knowing that are being recalibrated through the unknown experiences that are simply the lack of your interpretation to see the grace of this world. What that means is what Mr. Within really saw between uh, perhaps that scientific mind and religious mind that were arguing in bodies, that the argument was the conception of the origination. And so when two people in the mountain are trying to argue which way up the mountain is right, of course each one of them is going to say, of course my way is up, because they can only go that path. It has become real to them. And we must not uh, devalue human beings, because the same value that has led to the inspiration of some of our greatest scientists to realize who they are, whether, whether it was profound inertia questions being moved in a wagon, at an early age, or whether it was the introduction of the symbol of God as a collectivity of being. Whether you're religious, whether you are non-religious, whether you are scientific or you're non-scientific, we choose how we are to then communicate. What that means is when I speak to a human being, I realize that my intentions of how I see my world are also being communicated. What that means is when you put an angry person beside a very still person, you know, unless that still person has been aware of itself beyond a need to react in this world, what that means is if you have found the clarity of your being also being something that if you never had to move, you'd also be able to get realization, you totally reobserve uh, uh, the nature of movement in an alignment that uh, your freedom is beyond duality.
But while you go beyond, you realize you are going beyond by observing the duality and then innately knowing that which you are. Because what I've kind of known is that collective consciousness or that moment of very intuitive action, it's taking you to a certain... platform, if I can say. You will, as a human being, begin to activate yourself in a manner where you will take an existential responsibility for all that is. When you do, you see you can do nothing about it. What that means is regardless of how much you want to do something, you realize that of course man has a purpose and ambition and society must develop and we must, we must still, you know, develop advanced communicators and find great leaders among ourselves. The understanding is that in the big picture, because it's, ex it's an expanding universe, you must simply be in your lack of association present in that, in that sense of, let's say, picture. But if you choose to create a frame over this universe, you will immediately see the effects. What that means is you will see that moment where uh, if, if you as the child speak when someone else is speaking at uh, saying something very important, what that means is uh, that moment, uh, let's say if a great leader, let's say someone was, uh, someone was speaking and someone else suddenly tried to interrupt, there was a known sense of different difference in um, energetic communication. That means there was a reason every man stood silent when every being in that moment was silent to hear Martin Luther King speak. You know. You as existential attention are aware of all that is. And you will begin to see that compassion patience and sincerity and honesty is allowing you to also uh, be present, learn from the presence of all experience, whether it's someone else's experience in front of you or whether it's your experience or whether it's just the whole awareness of the moment and you're just here. And of course, guys, all of this is leading to the most profound understanding that before you can see a golden path, there should be an alchemy in your experience and self-awareness. You see, back then, lead was turned into gold. It was the alchemist's work. Now, you begin to see that how lead turned into gold was an innate transformation from within. And many people don't know what that means, but back then, back in the day, in certain spiritual cultures, you know, they acknowledged it. They acknowledged it very well that there was a transformation process, that how could you see a caterpillar and not see its immortality in the butterfly? How could you see the human being and not see its transcendence in how it engages life and is life and is flowing? What that means is when I looked around, I noticed that the golden path is within everyone. Everyone can go through their own metamorphosis, not one metamorphosis. And so you will see, uh, some poets had related, I believe it was Hafez, but he, he had poetically related uh, religion to these ships, these great ships, these great boats that had come to save man, right? Into maintaining his awareness to subtler thought. For, at times, much of humanity's individuality has been preserved by beings ha who have allowed themselves to experience collectivity. And they have done this in the silence 
of their being. And that is why we owe to humanity more than we can ever understand. We owe to existential intelligence more than we can understand. But it is not something that we owe in regards to if we do not, we perish. It is something that we owe to the cosmos within our gaze, to the consciousness that is aware of this reality. We don't want to just use words, don't have awareness, self-awareness and consciousness as, as words, have them as direct experience. What that means is that, that, that moment you're brushing your teeth, that is self-awareness, direct experience, you know? <laughs> You know, and you'll have cleaner teeth also. <laughs> I think in some way, brushing your teeth is some kind of alchemy, you know, you're t turning the lead of your teeth into gold. <laughs> Anyways, to continue. <clears throat> this sense of alchemical experiential, experiential understanding also happens in the way you walk. So how the metamorphosis happens uh, for the human experience that in a sense sees itself to individually be a caterpillar and very slow in this reality, suddenly begins to see that first thing you need to understand is that nature has its way. If you ignore nature's voice and consider yourself too much as an intelligent being, then you are not following and are not even allowing yourself existential, to be existentially sensitive to how the rhythm of your heart was a conversation with your world. And if we were to interrupt, our disturbance would be self-created in the sense that illusion is based on a, a, a sense of self, a sense of individuality that in its knowing that it is temporal is not finding its collectivity. But collectivity is innately given for in your wonder of how individuality is kept. The chirp of the bird is made to be heard by itself. Human communication in its observance will become advanced. How you walk on the golden path is to bring your sense of being to now, just the sense of now, and align yourself with the novelty of your breath. Just feel how every breath is like life getting a new update on being alive. And simply after breathing, become aware of reality, not based on how your past experiences have been, we will get to that, but first by how you are here. So first be aware that you are on some road and your intentions need to align for the greatness of humanity, but also for the greatness of the world of humanity. And so smile compassionately and so in your acknowledgement of the road, the golden aspect of it will become in how you have lived and then how through this living your engagement is that which is golden. What that means is regardless of how many <laughs> companies we want to start and senses of people we want to represent and how much we want to hug it out. <laughs> yeah. 
you are the alignment that you're waiting for. Be guided by what is here. Use your present day experience. What that means is use the experience you're having right now to orient the day rather than experiences of how you're going to feel if you do certain things. Intuition means trust life and the flows of alignment will, are there. They're here. What that means is uh, one of my greatest teachers is my heart and I learn from how I am naturally alive. And this guides me and it also uh, keeps the temples of sincerity and honesty clear, but it does not mean sincerity and honesty is this fluffy happiness. It means sometimes my honesty is to break myself, to have perhaps one of the darkest nights of, a sense of, darkest nights of the soul, if you, as people have said. But in a sense, having such, such a l lack of uh, responsibility for your life that you are even willing to condemn it. Right now, it is time for great activation in human beings. You walk the golden path being self-aware and you are guided by presence. Personality will change as much as any relationship. But presence and that sense of innate inner knowing of your externality will give you an observance that you shall see. <sighs> the beauty within all vision. And you will come back with a greater alignment. You, what that means is once a being taps into a sense of collective being, it sees it's only the individual who had to do something. The collective is already being done. So the grace comes in how you, even though you go through your alchemy, your, your sense of experiential alchemy, you still understand why you're here. And just before I share a story from ancient Persia, and that sense of spiritual culture, spiritual culture that was there, I also want to share a quote that says, what does a monk do before enlightenment? Chop wood, carry water. What does a monk do after enlightenment? Chop wood, carry water. So keep that quote in mind as I share this story with you. Back in the day, there was this alchemist, and this alchemist uh, had found a way to, had found this elixir that he could make anything into gold, and he felt like a very enlightened mind among these people, among people. One day he's going to a shoe store, and not a shoe store, but he's going to get his shoe fixed and he's just sitting there and he sees there's this old guy, very old man, this very old man, and he's put the shoe on this metal thing and he's fixing the shoe and he's so old that his hand's shaking before the hammer suddenly, bam, just hits the shoe, you know. And this alchemist, who was of course much younger, looks at this old man and he's like, let me make his day. I have found a way to make things into gold. Let me just make this, uh, this stone that he's making my shoe on into this metal that he's making my shoe on, in a sense, uh, gold. <clears throat> so after he gets his shoe, he thanks the guy. And he, he tells him, uh, I want to show you something. And he takes out his elixir or whatever, and he puts it on the... Uh, <laughs> on this metal thing and it immediately turns into gold and he sees the old man and wh while he puts the drop on this metal thing he then looks up to see the old man and he's like alright this guy's gonna thank me so much you know he sees the old guy look at him and the old guy suddenly it's as if he's suddenly he's realized something and he tells the guy not out of any sense of fear or instability but just looks at him very, very, with a very loud presence and tells him, uh, I don't want that in gold, change it back. And this alchemist gets mad. <laughs> and this alchemist says, old man, don't you understand? I just made this into gold, but I cannot turn it back. 
because our sciences have not developed that far, you know. Our understanding has not. And the old man looks at this and tells him, <laughs> the old man looks at this and he looks at the kid as if telling him, don't touch life like this again. And he touches it and changes the gold back into the metal it was. And the whole moral and the point of that story is that this human being who was so arrogant in thinking he had figured out such an understanding was not acknowledging the ability of life because we are choosing to keep it linear, but it has non-linear presence. And so this alchemist, young alchemist, learned from the true alchemy that is found in the ability of being, in that, in that, that realized being's ability was that it, he touched that metal and he took back and he changed it to the state of being that was aligned. There have been many profound stories like this, guys. And it's suggesting that you must, again, remember that monk's quote I told you, before realization, you just chop wood, carry water. After realization, you just chop wood, carry water. Because your realization is being understood in the untouchable aspects of reality, which are the presence beyond personality, suggesting that the truth for the personality was never truth for the direct experience of the moment of being that you are. Mankind must not degrade the cos cosmic intelligence that is, in a sense, divinely present in the existential attention of man. <laughs> and of course, these words are very crucial to be communicated often. Because existential attention is the, is the freedom of ob observance and attention before ideology that can be bashed and judged. What that means is you see that if human beings had never communicated to one another, there would be no war. But it's just that in their association of how their social structures developed, they valued themselves individually as ideas to communicate, but ideas are always trying to preserve their sense of identity. And we must cultivate within the human experience a multidimensional sense of awareness to ideology that is such beyond a, a lack of compassion in this world that compassion has immediately uh, been understood. What that means is Dalai Lama is giving the lesson for kindergarten students. <laughs> And this school is waiting for us to simply understand and become sincere and honest with it and just to flow with how the nature of being flows. What that means is that alchemist probably uh, threw down his books that moment and just ran to the sky and he's like, talk to me, let me see what you have to say. Because you see, if reality is potentially a projection, it will be a projection. If you have doubt, you are doubtful. Trust me. You must find a state of innate knowing. And this is the hope that has helped many of, uh, of many great leaders become great in how they have navigated into the unknown and how the pilot of consciousness has trusted reality even though reality has displayed many unknown aspects. And you really become comfortable with your I don't knows and perhaps you, you will have the ability to perhaps go and sit in front of a Zen master <laughs> and have a cup of tea that is its own silent sermon. The Buddha has this great story where it was said that he was giving a silent sermon. And out of all the people who were there, Buddha was just holding a flower and he was just smiling in his very beautiful Buddha way, you know. 
and Buddha's holding this flower, and it was said that out of all those people there, they were just silently, like just bowing, you know, just silently and, and just standing there. But out of, it was said out of all those people, it was only one old guy in the back who had understood what Buddha was doing, and he had just smiled. You know, it's a very beautiful traditional story. So in, the, in Buddha holding this flower, uh, the silent giving it and giving the silent sermon, it was that old guy in the end who really understood what it was because a smile naturally came. And I was wondering, what was that old guy realizing? And perhaps, potentially, you know, of course, I was, I'm, I was not there. <laughs> what that old guy, what that old, older gentleman was, had realized in the ser silent sermon is he saw that Buddha was such a realized being that in holding a flower and just being present, he was naturally giving the lesson that what he received from the natural world. In that why would a man need to hold a flower in front of other beings and smile? To communicate the gentle, gentleness in the natural world. That even though a man has picked out a flower and it might have killed the flower, he is holding it with the gentleness of the life that he knows he is still connected to. That even though we might be consuming and killing animals without even acknowledging their presence properly, without acknowledging the beings that are alive, without acknowledging life as life, we still are connected by some divine existential knowing, this co collective sense of being that it's as if regardless of how much you believed in which idea was right, Mr. Within knew that the divinity and sacredness of life was in the novelty of the moment that could not be spoken. But, and there's a beauty in how transcendence is brought now to be observed. It's as if the platform for the pilot of consciousness has become all forms of manifestation in the moment of awareness of the individual. And so the individual is no longer individual because he's seeing that the multidimensionality of the individual is coming from the potential of it to see everything at once. That's why integration was profound. That's why fractals was perhaps one of the greatest mathematical uh, 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 theories found and I believe it was perhaps Plato who said as above so below Plato or Socrates you know one of them and yeah I'm pretty sure it was Plato as above so below or this it might have been Aristotle gosh who knows <laughs> As the sages have said, as above, so below, we can see that our sight has a transcendental quality in how cause and effect are observed in an instant. Man might find it a bit irritating and stressful to find freedom, but you as a being are always free. You are a free being who then, in its conception, in its playground of conception, can play with its own suffering. Learn from the gentleness of this world. John F. Kennedy uh, said a nice quote at, at this uh, speech, and it was a speech after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And of course, as being the president of white men, and seeing the leader of black men at that time fall, he knew that there would be rage to also make the leader the white man fall. So he just went there and I'm pretty sure as a being who was aware of all life and the significance, he, he said this quote which he said he had gotten from the Greeks which was, to tame the savageness of man and make gentler the 
life of this world. The savageness is self-induced. Criminality is beginning with a lack of sensitivity to the laws of how the lives of others are kept. Law is not here to govern individuality, but to suggest that regardless if you were born or not, living was being done, life was present. And this requires a sense of honor and respect. You, you must see that you are a Bushido of life. You have this sense of nobility that I am natural expression. And so the greatest answers to my problems are those that naturally and very simply uh, uh, are just emanated out of my presence. Trust who you are. Don't think that you have to uh, get a mask and color it in a certain way to be acknowledged. But always be have, have the sense of honor that you are a moment of life, you're, you're a moment of experience. It's untouchable because your existential observance is transcendental. And perhaps the elegance of the infinity sign was how it cyclically was always in the same center. That means that one point in the center of the infinity sign did not see difference. And so transcendence must be initiated with your knowing of how you are in this world. What, not what you have to do to see what you are, what you already are innately, what is your directest experience. What that means is it, it was very exciting for Mr. Within to suddenly realize that there is the whole sense of being of the person to explore and learn from. What that means is, if you go in the mirror and simply sit and observe yourself, you will begin to see how many ideas you have on yourself that are just appearing there. But you as a being, as, as a human being, as an advanced communicator, as a pilot of consciousness, as a self-aware unit that can move beyond any unit, must be existentially comfortable with all that is. Be comfortable with all that is in your noise, that you hear in the noise, all, and also be comfortable with all that is in the silence. This is all aspects of the range of life you're seeing. And trust me, if you align yourself with your sense of feeling, it will align your thoughts too, because it seems that thoughts were trying to help you make, make yourself feel better. But if you just steer yourself with the sincerity of just being a bit more simpler and not making the game so complex, you'd be able to enjoy playing it. Duality is a playful game, but unity was always that which was beyond the game. Your chains are no longer there once you have found the observance that cannot be chained. How you walk on the golden path is to go within the innate. And you will see suddenly all that self-talk and thought disengages. You begin to find a bliss that has been a silence of eons where if you have even thought for one second that for lifetimes you've been going on repeating the same patterns, it has all stopped. There's a silence here that is not the pattern, you know. What that means is you are drawing a picture and you think you're the picture, no. You're the intelligence of the design that even observed the emptiness to even bring forth. You are such a being that 
you right now are aware of how form is becoming apparent in, con in your consciousness. And you will learn in how you navigate in this plane of existence. How you are. And in a sense, gracefully have been. For the beautiful thing, the most beautiful thing about a speech that begins is that it too can end. And this is perhaps where words come to life. And life begins to see that it could never be warded. <laughs> Much blessings and honesty.